have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and open up to the book of Matthew. It's the first book, this, it's the gospel, the first book in the New Testament, or Old, bleh, in the New Testament, y'all. Come on. <laughs> in first service, I kept saying Christmas instead of Christmas. I don't know what that was about. So y'all missed a funny one there. <laughs> but Matthew chapter 1 is what we are going to be looking and reading at this morning. If you would, all stand in reverence as we read the Word of God. We're going to begin in chapter 1, verse 18, and we're going to go all the way through that little section there to verse 25. It begins on verse 18, and it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, verse 25, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus, a precious name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we get to read and be here and just to, just to lift you up and exalt your name, to be in this season, just to proclaim your name, that you are the one that we all seek. I thank you, Lord God, for all you're doing and all you are going to do. In your mighty name we pray, all God's people said, amen. amen, amen, amen. You may be seated right where you are this morning. So as we jump into this new season called Christmas, everybody say Christmas. Come on, somebody. Somebody's really in love with Christmas, and that's me right here, okay? We are going to rediscover Christmas. Everybody say rediscover. You know, throughout our time as humans, Christmas has come just like a secondary holiday, another holiday that we get to celebrate, a day that we get to take off from school and from work. Well, we need to re be reminded what Christmas is all about. So I entitled today this series to be Rediscovering Christmas. We need to rediscover what Christmas is all about. And my topic for today is all I want for Christmas. All I want for Christmas. All I want for Christmas. What do you want for Christmas? Have you made your list? We're in this time period where everybody's getting their list ready. I saw some nieces and nephews over the weekend with Thanksgiving, and they've already got their list, and they've already been giving it out. We're already talking about who's bringing what and what's happening, and, and my wife and I are saying, we don't know when the baby's coming, so we don't know if we're going to be there, uh, but we'll get the gifts, and we'll do that, and, but we're, we're all trying to figure out what is taking place and what's going to happen. Well, one of my favorite songs growing up was this song right here. And I think many of y'all know it. So if you know it, please sing it with me. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. My two front teeth. My two front teeth. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. And we'll just stop it there because I don't know the rest of the words. <laughs> But because I don't know the rest of the words, that's fine. But that song was one of my favorite growing up. And here's the reason why. I know some of y'all are going to be like, man, you're a mean brother. My sister at a young age, about five, six years old, she actually had tripped um, over a, a rug that was in the middle of the living room. And she fell on a table hitting her mouth. 
My mom had a rusher to the ER and all four front teeth on the top had to be pulled and removed. She damaged it that bad. It wasn't until age 12 to 13 that her teeth finally begun to come in only for the reason her gum was hard and the teeth were having a hard time piercing through the gum. So as five brothers and four sisters, you can only imagine what song we sang every Christmas year. All I want for Christmas is my two. I know, I know cruel brothers and sisters. I tell you what, I tell you what. But that it's, but so for that year and for those many years, my sister wanted her front teeth. She, that's all she wanted for Christmas. Just my two front teeth. Like, although we made a joke about it, it was serious. She wanted her two front teeth. Like she wanted her four front teeth, really. Um, we tried rewriting it. It just didn't work. But she had her list. She had her Christmas list. She wanted her teeth and so much more. I remember there was one year as I was growing up, I was 16 years old, still at home. And, and as I was there, my mom would ask us to write down two or three things we want Santa to bring. I say Santa because there's kids in the room. Um, so Santa, right? And, and so we would write two or three things that we would want and, and we would put it down. And, but this year at 16 years old, I was just at that teenage time where I was like, mom, I don't want anything. She was like, what do, you, what do you mean you don't want anything? Everybody wants something. Like, what, what do you want? I, I, don't, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. I knew my, the stress my parents were in, but I, I also just didn't have a desire to need something or want something that I didn't need. I didn't want to just get something just for the fun of it. I wanted to get something that I knew I was going to use or I needed. There was one year, sidetracked, there was one year my mom just gave us a bunch of oranges and apples because it was something we all needed instead of wanted. But anyway, <laughs> I'll take it over coal. But that specific year, I did not know what I wanted. I prayed and I asked, I was like, I don't, I don't know. I looked, I looked everywhere. I was like, I don't know what I want. And so it went all the way up until that day of Christmas Eve. My mom was like, are you sure you don't want anything? I said, no, I, I don't want anything. And she said, okay, well, the time came for us to open gifts. And of course, being mom and dad, you didn't want one out of 10 to not get anything. So she still did. And as your pastor, as you know, I'm a huge Chicago Bears fan. So of course they got me some Chicago Bears stuff, a pillow, a blanket blanket and a bunch of other things. But there was one specific item that they gave me that I was not very thrilled about. That was a Bible. At 16 years old, they gave me a Bible and I was not thrilled about this Bible. I was like, a Bible. I got one when I was a baby. Isn't that enough? Like <laughs> my wife and I were in the understanding as we were dating that we were not going to ministry. But can I tell you, never tell God no. Never tell him no, because the moment you say, I will never get on stage, is the moment God will tell me to go talk to you to get on stage. You watch, you watch. Don't ever tell God no, because it might just happen. My wife and I were set in stone, no ministry. Our parents, both sides were in ministry. And we said, you know what? It's not, it's not for us, not, not the pastoring role and all of that. And look at where we are today. <laughs> I would have it no other way. But that Bible at 16 years old, I might have not have seen the significance of that Bible. But what I come to quickly realize in my early years of beginning to pastor in kids and youth was that was the exact Bible I begun to preach from. And as I became lead pastor here at Grace Bible Church, that was the Bible that I had begun to read from and preach from. I didn't know what God had planned in that Bible at age 16, but he knew where it was going to take me later on. There's another story of a little boy who parents also told him to make a list. This is not me. This was not my wife. But they also said, hey, get a couple items of, of what you want for Christmas. So he wrote a bunch of things. You know, little kids, they get the pictures. They got to cut it out. They got to put it. They got to make it all nice and neat for Santa. And so the parents got that list and they started looking at it and they started chuckling at the very last item. And the husband went over there and said, what are you chuckling at? And she pointed at it. And at the very last item that he wanted was an ATM machine. Mom and dad said money doesn't grow on trees, but it does come out of the machines. So get me one of them. <laughs> we all have a list. 
We all have a list on what we want for Christmas. And so for today, I have four points that I want us as Grace Bible Church, as me as an individual, I have written a wish list as well. A wish list that I want us to have. A wish list that I want us as a church to have. And the very first one is I would like to have the faith like Mary and Joseph. I would love to have the faith like Mary and Joseph. You see, in the year, early years of my wife and I uh, get going into ministry, uh, we were full-time in kids' ministry. That was our first uh, paid position, and, and we did not get paid very much. But we aren't in it for the money. God doesn't call pastors in it for the money. He calls them to be a steward. He calls us to preach the word. And that's what I, we knew that. We knew that. We knew that he was going to make a way if he called to. And so we had to have that in our mindset. We always had to live by faith because, because we weren't making so much. We had to have faith that God was going to get us through those tough seasons. And I don't know about you, but my wife and I did something that is ugly, and that is doing a budget. It's horrible. But we did, right? We, we did a budget, and we put our tithe and offering. That was, that was one thing that neither one of us ever wavered on. That was always the number one, and we always did that before we ever did any other bills. And I tell you what, as, as, as days went on in the month, it felt like there was more days in the month than there was money in the bank. Anybody relate to that okay that's how it felt and when we got to the little bit of the last month God would always make a way he always made a way for us to meet wherever we were at and it got to the point where I had to take on another job I was an uber driver while I was pastoring just to try to do a little bit extra to try to do a little bit more but it was a lot of wear and tear but God always provided fast forward a little bit my wife and I are called to Grace Bible Church now we're called to Grace Bible Church we just bought our home our first home over in the Seguin area we've been in that home for a year and a half which homeowners know a year and a half is not a long time to get anything out of the home but we were there for a year and a half and we did not have a savings account we did not have a way to just sell this one and go buy another one and so what we had to do is we had a, a realtor friend that sat us down and we sat down and we said, what do we need to do in order to get another home? We didn't know if we were going to have to live with our parents or apartment. All we knew is God was calling us to, he will make a way no matter what it is. If it's an apartment we live in, so be it. If it's her parents that we have to be in for a little bit, so be it. If he provides another home, so be it. We just knew God where God was calling us and he would make the way on where we are supposed to be. And so that's our our mindset that's what we went into as and so as we sat down with the realtor she said you are going to have to ask for this amount on the market in order just to get a little bit to be able to put it towards another home and that price was forty thousand dollars more than what we bought our house for that is a lot in a year and a half and my wife and I looked at each other and we prayed about it and we said put it on the market market for that amount if it's God's will, he'll make the way. In less than two months, that exact offer was met. We were able to take that money. We lived in her, at her parents for a week or two, and then we were able to put that money on a new home. God made a way. God made a way even when our bank account said, you can't do it. God still made a way. Faith makes a way. And I love that about faith. My wife and I didn't know, and as we, even when we stayed with her, my in-laws, we actually had the U-Haul there, and the U-Haul, you know, to drive it from Seguin over here was going to be over $400 in price, and especially us having to hold it for about a week. All of our stuff sat in the U-Haul for a week. I had an extension cord going out the back for our deep freezer into her parents' garage just to make sure it stayed on. I mean, it was during the heat of the summer, so we weren't sure what our stuff was going to look like coming out but we knew God had a place we knew we had a bed we knew we had a roof and so we we lived through it we went through it that u-haul that was supposed to cost over four hundred dollars we came out in this area and we just started praying God show up show up we know we can swipe a credit card but that's not the way we want to do this God show us what we can do show us what you can do and in that moment u-haul called saying that our bill was not just over four hundred dollars it was going to only be 
$50 for an over a week of being able to use all the miles that we put in it. 50, God made a way. He knew our budget and he met the budget. He knew what was going to take place and he met it. He always meets us where we are at. He always meets us where we are at. And not to mention when we came to Grace Bible Church and we started digging into the finances and looking, we saw that the account to the church was only $200 to its name. We did not know if we were going to get paid, if the lights were going to be able to stay on, what finances we're going to look at. But can I tell you, out of the faithfulness of this church, we never had to go unpaid. The bills never got unpaid. The lights always stayed on. The water stayed running. Those doors stayed open and people kept on getting saved. And then three months later, we get hit with COVID. Doors go and they shut. We don't know. Walking into a church, trying to start an online, we, we didn't know what God had in store. We just knew three months after we arrived, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. It was all in his plan. We just had to live day by day in faith. And every single day he showed up. Every day we, not, we had not ever had to get a loan out of the bank. We have been able to pay all the bills and God has been faithful time and time again. And I love that about our God. And I, I know some of y'all are saying, okay, pastor, we get it. You and your wife are faithful. <laughs> like I, I see those eyes rolling really. The, the glare is like, oh, pastor, come on. You're putting me to sleep. Already. Can I tell you, there are some days, me as pastor, where my faith is absolutely pitiful. Pitiful horrible even though i've seen god do what looked impossible make possible my faith still sometimes gets wavered the disciples even had doubts after seeing miracle after miracle after miracle with jesus they still have doubts it's not bad to have doubts we just got to get our mind back in check saying no because my god's able and so every day Every day, I want more faith like Mary and Joseph. Every day, I want more faith. And for this Christmas season on our list one, I want us to have more faith because I believe God's bringing an Elisha moment where we're going to experience twice the bountiful. We're going to see God move twice the amount. We're going to see him do what we think is impossible. He's going to make possible. We're going to see a mighty hand move. So we need to be ready for the faith and ask God for the faith on our Christmas list. Number two in what we have is I would like to have the humility of the shepherds. The humility of the shepherds. You know, it was the shepherds that heard of Christmas. They were one of the very first ones that ever heard of the Christmas story about to take place. They were so humble before God and believed the message that the angels had given them. But why? Why shepherds? Shepherds were like the lowest of the low. Like if they had an Instagram, they would have zero followers, okay? That is how the shepherds were. They were the lowest of the low. They didn't, they, they, you didn't want to be a shepherd. They weren't rich. They weren't famous. They had no influential, they, they, they had nothing. Why a shepherd? Why not King Herod? Why not Judea? Why not to the emperor of Rome? Why not Caesar? Here's why. They were powerful and prideful rulers. They were prideful rulers. Their major concern was not the savior that was born, but about making themselves stay in power. They wanted the power. They didn't want it to go to another baby or another individual. Can I tell you, you do not have to be a good person right now. If you've never given your life to Christ, you don't have to be a good person to give your life over to God. You just have to have a heart like a shepherd and be humble going before God with a humble heart saying, God, I know I've done wrong. I know I've messed up, but you, my God is able and you will wash my slate clean. These shepherds also watched the stars. They looked at the stars. They saw the stars and they saw what was coming and God honored their faithfulness by an angelic appearance. 
and by including them in the word of God, which will last now forever. A story that we read year after year. We live in such a society today where it's the I generation. It's all about me. What do I want? How do I want it? If I don't get it, I'm going to be mad at mom and dad. I, if, if I don't get healing, God, if I don't get healing, then I don't think there is really a God. If you don't do this, God, are you even that real? We try to make it about us when God says it was never about you to begin with. It was about me and my glory. I sent my son for you to die on the cross so that you can live with me in eternity. He's chasing after you this morning. He's running after you. He's saying, I got you. I don't care of your past. I've got you. I was trying to think of a, a, some type of verse that would go with it, and I had to come up with my own uh, for this generation. If this generation had a verse, it would go something like this. He that tooteth not his own horn does not get his own horn tooted. <laughs> if I toot my horn and you don't toot my horn back, then hey, then it's just not it. There is so much pride in our world today. There is so much pride. It's, it's this school against this school. It's this work against this work. It's this sibling saying how much better than they are about this sibling. Y'all have those siblings? Where it's like your younger sibling's like, I got a nicer car than you. <laughs> it's like a competition all the time. It's like it, there's always this pride that rises and is constantly up in the air. And God doesn't like prideful people. He wants a humble heart. In Philippians, it even tells us every man needs to esteem others greater than himself. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You might not be God. You might not be Jesus, but you can sure strive to be like him. You might fail and have to get back up and wipe yourself back off, but you continue on that path that he's called you to. The humility of the shepherds made it possible for God to honor them and exalt them because their hearts were humble before the Lord. What a high privilege for their ears to be the first to hear the Christmas message outside of Mary and Joseph. Their response shows humility. You know, I can, I, I can just imagine in today's time, if, if, the, if they were shepherds and, and, and you looked up at the stars and a young person saw it and this young person, this young shepherd saw it in school, they were like, huh, I'm going to go on Facebook and see if everyone else is doing it first. <laughs> One moment. Why? Why do we do that in our time today? We do it because we're a follower and not a leader. We have to know God's voice. And when we know our Father's voice, we don't have to second guess ourselves. We don't have to worry about what others are doing. We continue on the path that He's got for us because we know He has the authority. They said, Let us go and see this thing which has come to pass. They believed what the angels told them. They didn't have to see if others were doing it first. They didn't have to check out a Facebook to see if others were doing it. They knew the Father's voice and they went. And because of their humility, they ministered to Mary and Joseph by affirming to them that what had come to pass was of God. You ever need that reassurance? Come on, somebody. You ever need that reassurance that God did tell you to go where he's calling you to go? What if he's calling you as a shepherd boy, as a shepherd girl to begin to move? And it's not because of you. It's because of what you're going to do for someone else. If we are going to be servants of God, then we must have a humble heart before God. God, whatever you give me to do, if it is guarding sheep by night, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. What is that saying? It's saying, I would be good with the lowest of low, God. I'd rather be with you than the wickedness at all. So for those that think, oh, nursery, mm -mm, no, I'm too high privileged for that. Let me tell you something. That's the next generation. 
That's the next generation of ministers, the next generation of pastors, maybe the legislative that's going to be in the office in Washington. We don't know what God has planned for them, and we've got to treat them with respect and teach them and discipline them so they can know what Christmas is all about. And I'm not talking about Christmas with gifts, and I'm not saying gifts is wrong, but I'm talking about true Christmas because there's a day and time where Christmas is coming back, and Jesus Christ is revealing himself. Number three on our wish list. Number three, I would like to have the generous spirit of the wise men. The generous spirit. The wise men didn't go with whatever they had in their pocket. They went with value. They went saying, this is my king. This is my Messiah. I will give. Now, the Bible does not say how many wise men there were but we do know there were at least three because of the three gifts that were given and that are mentioned within the word of God. Gold, frankincense, and there we go. You know it. Gold was for a king. Gold was for a king. The gift indicates they recognized who he was. The frankincense was for a priest. This gift indicates that they responded to who he was. The myrrh was for a prophet. This gift indicates they recognized what he came to do. Myrrh myrrh was used to embalm dead bodies. So you have gold for lordship, you have frankincense for fellowship, and you have myrrh for sonship. The Messiah was a prophet, he was a priest, and he was a king. And in that time, there were prophets, there were kings, and there were priests. But there was never a man who was a prophet, king, and priest. That is the value of our God. So they brought the frankincense, gold, and myrrh, something which had high value in their eyes. They brought to the king. Christmas is about the generous spirit of the wise men. It is about the spirit that says, my talent, my time, my treasure, I lay them at your feet, Lord. I give myself over to you like the shepherds with a humble heart. Are you having gifts and talents that you have yet to share with others? Because you might be that timid shepherd person that's saying, I don't know if it's God's voice. And because of your disobedience, someone's not being blessed by it. We have to get out of our comfort zone and begin to listen to our father and use the gifts and talents that he has given us so that others may be blessed, not for us, but for him. Second Corinthians 8, 5 says, and they did not do as we expected, but gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. We can all jump in and start helping with the door or with kids or with youth. And we can all start doing that. But unless we go to God and give him ourselves first, all of that is nothing. We have to give him ourself. We have to give him ourself and everything we have. In our society, we've, we've looked at the Madison Avenue quote very strongly. Madison Avenue once said, we have to have things to be happy. And our economy tells us you need, you need, you need. And in return, the individuals say, I want, I want, I want. Where's the eye society coming from? We have to have our eyes open. There was no human selfishness in the wise men. They had sacrificial hearts before God. They studied the stars. And when they saw the star appear, they said, now, now's the time to go. God honored them with a place in his word that will last forever. My fourth on my list is going to be that I would like to have the commitment of Simeon and Anna. I know some of y'all are saying, Simeon and Anna? Like, we don't listen to, like, who are they? They're not Christmas. We need to hear their story. Their story is very, very powerful. This couple, 
Simeon and Anna were very much senior adults on the cutting edge, if you will. They were full-time workers in the temple. Simeon had received a revelation that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And when he saw Jesus, he blessed him and said, now thy servant can depart in peace. You see, this couple was there and entered into this drama with Jesus being born. He saw baby Jesus, the Messiah. And when he saw him, he exited the stage. Maybe you're saying, you know, pastor, I'm just too old to do anything. This is a story you need to look more into. It doesn't matter your age. What matters is your heart. The willingness. My wife and I have an adopted grandma. How old is she? High upper 70s? And she just now stepped down from nursery. So maybe you're saying, I, I, I can't even do nursery. Grandma can do nursery. Grandma and nursery? Shoo. Those are memories that are going to be made. Those kids need grandma. Because some of those kids don't have one. Some of those kids don't have a mom or dad. Those kids need grandma in there. They need a mom figure, dad figure. They need a couple, a parent figure. Anna went to the temple as a full-time worker after her husband dies in their seventh year of marriage. She was 84 years old. She offered her thanks to the Lord. And you know, as I, as I think of that, and I think of their story and their commitment that they had so much for the Lord, I think of a landcraft carrier. If, a, if, a, if an aircraft has to pinpoint exactly the dot to where the runway is, they have to be fully committed to their landing. If they are not fully committed at that point of descent, they can lose their life. They have to commit their everything into it. So I ask you, have you committed your everything into God? Your whole life is at stake. It's either heaven or hell and you get to be the one who chooses. I've known commitment a few times in my walk, in my life, but I like to be more committed. And I think it would be a great Christmas present for all of us to have more commitment in what God has planned for every single one of us. My wife and I have met individuals that will tell us, Pastor, I want, I want, I want a marriage like yours. I want a relationship like yours. Can I tell you? It's commitment. Every day, it's commitment. It's getting up and choosing to be in love. What do you do when you fight? You don't just get up and leave. You work through it. But so many, when, when things get rough and rocky with God, it's easier for us to walk away than be committed to Him. And we need to be committed on the highs and lows. We need to be committed constantly. Commit to your husband. Commit to your wife. Commit to your marriage and what God wants for it. Single guys, single ladies, young ones, old ones. You might be saying, hey, I want a companion. I want a husband. I want a wife, but I haven't got it yet. Can I give you one advice? Commit to God. Learn what commitment is now because the world will not teach you what commitment is. If we can learn what commitment is now, then our strength in God will get us through the rough times in marriage. We need the strength of God once again. We need commitment once again. Don't think God doesn't have a person for you. But continue to grow closer to Him. Continue to seek Him. Learn what that commitment is. There was a time in my life when I thought I had a gift of faith. 
until I met someone who had it. There was a time in my life when I thought I had the gift of humility until I met someone who did. There was a time in my life when I thought I had the gift of generosity until I met someone who did. There was a time in my life when I thought I had the gift of commitment until I met someone who did. Now that I have seen these virtues in others called the Bible, story after story of these virtues, I want more of them for myself on my Christmas this year. I want to be reminded what Christmas is all about so I can teach our little ones what Christmas is all about. Gifts are fun. Decorating the tree is great. We've done it. We do it. But that's not the reason we have it. The reason we do it is for God. So here's my question to you. What is on your Christmas list? This Christmas, what do you want more of? Do you want more faith? Do you want more generosity? Are you a penny pincher where you just say, God, I cannot give you anything. I just can't do it. Are, are you a person that's saying, God, I need faith. I, I don't know how to get out of my comfort zone. I need faith to where I just step out and you guide the way. What do you need? What do you need? Maybe it's something in your individual life. Maybe it's something in your marriage. But this is something we should all reflect on what we need this Christmas season. Can we all stand? With every eye closed and head bowed, before we end with a worship song, before we end, with every eye closed, I want to give you the opportunity to say, I want to give my life to God. I want to bow my heart in humility, just like the shepherds. I want to step out in faith, just like Mary and Joseph. I'm ready to give my life over to God. If you're saying, I want to give my life to God for the very first time, would you just slip up your hand with all eyes closed? We don't want to embarrass you. We just want to pray with you. Amen. God sees your hand. Is there anybody else? Amen. 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 You can put your hand down. God bless you. Can we all just repeat this prayer right now? Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you came to this world to die on the cross and to be raised from the grave three days later. And today, I am making a, a bold commitment and committing my life to you. right where you are. If you are the individual that raised your hand for the first time saying that prayer, I want you in your own words right now just to tell God your heart. Maybe it's, it's broken. Maybe it's hurting. Maybe it's something you need. And while they do that, I want everybody else just to begin in their own spirit. Just tell God, tell the Holy Spirit what you need. Is it more faith? Let him know what's on your wish list. Make your request known to him what you're needing this Christmas season. Whatever it is, begin to make that list right now.